The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger, Chapter 24. Mr. and Mrs. Antolini had this very swanky apartment over on Sutton Place with two steps that you go down to get into the living room and a bar and all. I'd been there quite a few times because after I left Elkin Hills, Mr. Antolini came up to our house for dinner quite frequently to find out how I was getting along. He wasn't married then. Then, when he got married, I used to play tennis with he and Mrs. Antolini quite frequently out at the West Side Tennis Club in Forest Hills, Long Island. Mrs. Antolini belonged there. She was lousy with dough. She was about 60 years older than Mr. Antolini, but they seemed to get along quite well. For one thing, they were both very intellectual, especially Mr. Antolini, except that he was more witty than intellectual when you were with him, sort of like D.B. Mrs. Antolini was mostly serious. She had asthma pretty bad. They both read all D.B.'s stories, Mrs. Antolini too, and when D.B. went to Hollywood, Mr. Antolini phoned him up and told him not to go. He went anyway, though. Mr. Antolini said that anybody that could write like D.B. had no business going out to Hollywood. That's exactly what I said, practically. I would have walked down to their house because I didn't want to spend any of Phoebe's Christmas dough that I didn't have to, but I felt funny when I got outside, sort of dizzy. So I took a cab. I didn't want to, but I did. I had a hell of a time even finding a cab. Old Mr. Antolini answered the door when I rang the bell after the elevator boy finally let me up. The bastard. He had on his bathrobe and slippers, and he had a highball in one hand. He was a pretty sophisticated guy, and he was a pretty heavy drinker. Hold him away, he said. My God, he's grown another 20 inches. Fine to see you. How are you, Mr. Antolini? How's Mrs. Antolini? We're both just dandy. Let's have that coat. He took off my coat. Oh, he took my coat off me and hung it up. I expected to see a day old infant in your arms. Nowhere to turn. Snowflakes in your eyelashes. He's a very witty guy sometimes. He turned around and yelled out to the kitchen, Lillian, how's the coffee coming? Lillian was Mrs. Antolini's first name. It's all ready, she yelled back. Is that Holden? Hello, Holden. Hello, Mrs. Antolini. You were always yelling when you were there. That's because the both of them were never in the same room at the same time. It was sort of funny. Sit down, Holden, Mr. Antolini said. You could tell he was a little oiled up. The room looked like they had just had a party. Glasses were all over the place and dishes with peanuts in them. Excuse the appearance of the place, he said. We've been entertaining some buffalo friends of Mrs. Antolini's. Some buffaloes, as a matter of fact. I laughed, and Mrs. Antolini yelled something into me from the kitchen, but I couldn't hear her. What'd she say? I asked Mr. Antolini. She said not to look at her when she comes in. She just arose from the sack. Have a cigarette. Are you smoking now? Thanks, I said. I took a cigarette from the box he offered me. Just once in a while. I'm a moderate smoker. I'll bet you are, he said. He gave me a light from this big lighter off the table. So, you and Pensy are no longer one, he said. He always said things that way. Sometimes it amused me a lot and sometimes it didn't. He sort of did it a little bit too much. I don't mean he wasn't witty or anything. He was, but sometimes it gets on your nerves when somebody's always saying things like, so you and Pensy are no longer one. DB does it too much sometimes too. What was the trouble? Mr. Antolini asked me. How did you do in English? I'll show you the door in short order if you flunked English, you little ace composition writer. Oh, I passed English all right. It was mostly literature, though. I only wrote about two compositions the whole term, I said. I flunked oral expression, though. They had this course you had to take oral expression that I flunked. Why? Oh, I don't know. I didn't feel much like going into it. I was still feeling sort of dizzy or something, and I had a hell of a headache all of a sudden. I really did. 
but you could tell he was interested. So I told him a little bit about it. It's this course where each boy in class has to get up in class and make a speech, you know, spontaneous and all. And as if the boy digresses at all, you're supposed to yell digression at him as fast as you can. It just about drove me crazy. I got an F in it. Why? Oh, I don't know. That digression business got on my nerves. I don't know. The trouble with me is I like it when somebody digresses. It's more interesting and all. You don't care to have somebody stick to the point when he tells you something? Oh, sure. I like somebody to stick to the point and all. But I don't like them to stick to the point too too much to the point. I don't know. I guess I don't like it when somebody sticks to the point all the time. The boys that got the best marks in oral expression were the ones that stuck to the point all the time. I admit it. But there was this one boy, Richard Kinsella. He didn't stick to the point too much. And they were always yelling digression at him. It was terrible because in the first place, he was a very nervous guy. I mean, he was a very nervous guy and his lips were always shaking whenever it was his time to make a speech. And you could hardly hear him if you were sitting way in the back of the room. When his lips sort of quit shaking a little bit though, I asked his, I like his speeches better than anybody else's. He practically flunked the course though too. He got a D plus because they kept yelling digression at him all the time. For instance, he made this speech about this farm his father bought in Vermont. They kept yelling digression at him the whole time he was making it. And this teacher, Mr. Vincent, gave him an F on it because he hadn't told what kind of animals and vegetables and stuff grew on the farm and all. What he did was... Richard Kinsella, he'd start telling you about all that stuff. And then all of a sudden, he'd start telling you about this letter his mother got from his uncle and how his uncle got polio and all when he was 42 years old and how he wouldn't let anybody come to see him in the hospital because he didn't want anybody to see him with a brace on. It didn't have much to do with the farm, I admit it. But it was nice. It's nice when somebody tells you about their uncle, especially when they start out telling you about their father's farm and then all of a sudden get more interested in their uncle. I mean, it's dirty to keep yelling digression at him when he's all nice and excited. I don't know. It's hard to explain. I didn't feel too much like trying either. For one thing, I had this terrific headache all of a sudden. I wish to God old Mrs. Antolini would come in with the coffee. That's something that annoys the hell out of me. I mean, if somebody says there's coffee already and it isn't, Holden, one short, faintly stuffy pedagogical question. Don't you think there's a time and a place for everything? Don't you think if someone starts out to tell you about his father's farm, he should stick to his guns and then get around to telling you about his uncle's brace? Or if his uncle's brace is such a provocative subject, shouldn't he have selected it in the first place as his subject, not the farm? I didn't feel much like thinking and answering at all. I had a headache and I felt lousy. I even had a sort of a stomach ache, if you want to know the truth. Yes, I don't know. I guess he should. I mean, I guess he should have picked his uncle as a subject instead of the farm if that interested him the most. But what I mean is lots of time, you don't know what interests you most till you start talking about something that doesn't interest you most. I mean, you can't help it sometimes. What I think is you're supposed to leave somebody alone if he's at least being interesting and he's getting all excited about something. I like it when somebody gets excited about something. It's nice. You just you just didn't know this teacher, Mr. Vincent. He could drive you crazy sometimes. Him and the goddamn class. I mean, he'd keep telling you to unify and simplify all the time. Some things you just can't do that to. I mean, you can't hardly ever simplify and unify something just because somebody wants you to. You didn't know this guy, Mr. Vincent. I mean, he was very intelligent and all, but you could tell he didn't have too much brains. Coffee, gentlemen, finally, Mrs. Antolini said. She came in carrying this tray with coffee and cakes and stuff on it. Holden, don't you even peek at me. I'm a mess. Hello, Mrs. Antolini, I said. 
I started to get up and all, but Mr. Antolini got a hold of my jacket and pulled me back down. Old Mrs. Antolini's hair was full of those iron curler jobs, and she didn't have any lipstick or anything on. She didn't look too gorgeous. She looked pretty old and all. I'll leave this right here. Just dive in, you two, she said. She put the tray down on the cigarette table, pushing all these glasses out of the way. How is your mother, Holden? She's fine, thanks. I haven't seen her too recently, but the last I... Darling, if Holden needs anything, everything's in the linen closet, the top shelf. I'm going to go to bed. I'm exhausted, Mrs. Angelini said. She looked it, too. Can you boys make up the couch by yourselves? We'll take care of everything. You run along to bed, Mr. Antolini said. He gave Mrs. Antolini a kiss and she said goodbye to me and went into the bedroom. They were always kissing each other a lot in public. I had a part of a cup of coffee and about a half of some cake that was as hard as a rock. All old Mr. Antolini had was another highball, though. He makes them strong, too. You could tell. He may get to be an alcoholic if he doesn't watch his step. I had lunch with your dad a couple of weeks ago, he said all of a sudden. Did you know that? No, I didn't. You're aware, of course, that he's terribly concerned about you. I know it. I know he is, I said. Apparently, before he phoned me, he just had a long, rather harrowing letter from your latest headmaster to the effect that you were making absolutely no effort at all, cutting classes, coming unprepared to all of your classes in general, being an all-around, I didn't cut any classes. You weren't allowed to cut any. There were a couple of them that I didn't attend once in a while, like that oral expression I told you about, but I didn't cut any. I didn't feel like discussing it. The coffee made my stomach feel a little better, but I still had this awful headache. Mr. Antolini lit another cigarette. He smoked like a fiend. Then he said, frankly, I don't know what the hell to say to you, Holden. I know. I'm very hard to talk to. I realize that. I have a feeling that you're riding for some kind of a a terrible, terrible fall. But I, I don't know, honestly, what kind. Are you listening to me? Yes. You could tell he was trying to concentrate and all. It may be the kind of where... At the age of 30, you sit in some bar hating everybody who comes in looking as if he might have played football in college. And then again, you may pick up just enough education to hate people who say it's a secret between he and I. Or you may end up in some business office throwing paper clips at the nearest stenographer. I just don't know. But do you know what I'm driving at and all? Yes, sure, I said. I did too. But you're wrong about the hating business. I mean, about hating football players and all. You really are. I don't hate too many guys. What I may do, I may hate them for a little while. Like this guy Stratladder. I knew at Pensy and this other boy, Robert Ackley, I hated them once in a while, I admit it, but it doesn't last too long, is what I mean. After a while, if I didn't see them, if it if they didn't come in the room or if I didn't see them in the dining room for a couple of meals, I sort of miss them. I mean, I sort of miss them. Mr. Antolini didn't say anything for a while. He got up and got another hunk of ice and put it in his drink. Then he sat down again. You could tell he was thinking. I kept wishing, though, that he'd continue the conversation in the morning instead of now. But he was hot. People are mostly hot to have a discussion when you're not. All right, listen to me a minute now. I may not word this as memorably as I'd like to, but I'll write you a letter about it in a day or two. And then you can get it all straight. But listen now anyway. He started concentrating again. And then he said, this fall, I think you're riding for, it's, it's a special kind of fall. 
a horrible kind. The man falling isn't permitted to feel or hear himself hit bottom. He just keeps falling and falling. The whole arrangement's designed for men who, at some time or other in their lives, were looking for something their own environment couldn't supply them with. Or they thought their own environment couldn't supply them with, so they gave up looking. They gave it up before they even ever really got started. You follow me? Yes, sir. Sure. Yes. He got up and poured some more booze in his glass. And then he sat down again. He didn't say anything for a long time. I don't want to scare you, he said, but I can very clearly see you're dying nobly one way or another for some highly unworthy cause. He gave me a funny look. If I write something down for you, will you read it carefully and keep it? Yes, sure, I said. I did too. I still have the paper he gave me. He went over to this desk on the other side of the room and without sitting down, wrote something on a piece of paper. And then he came back and sat down with the paper in his hand. Oddly enough, this wasn't written by a practicing poet. It was written by a psychoanalyst named Wilhelm Steckel. Here's what he, are you still with me? Yes, sure I am. Here's what he said. The mark of the immature man is that he wants to die nobly for a cause, while the mark of the mature man is that he wants to live humbly for one. He leaned over and handed it to me. I read it right when he gave it to me. And then I thanked him and all and put it in my pocket. It was nice of him to go to all that trouble. It really was. The thing was, though, I didn't feel much like concentrating. Boy, I felt so damn tired all of a sudden. You could tell that he wasn't tired and all, though. He was pretty oiled up for one thing. I think that one of these days, he said, you're going to have to find out where you want to go. And then you've got to start going there. But immediately, you can't afford to lose a minute. Not you. I nodded because he was looking right at me and all, but I wasn't too sure what he was talking about. I was pretty sure I knew, but I wasn't positive, too positive at the time. I was just too damn tired. And I hate to tell you, he said, but I think that once you have a fair idea where you want to go, your first move will be to apply yourself in school. You'll have to. You're a student. Whether the idea appeals to you or not, you're in love with knowledge. And I think you'll find once you get past all the Mr. Vanessa's and their oral comp, Mr. Vincent's, I said. He meant all the Mr. Vincent's, not all the Mr. Vanessa's. I shouldn't have interrupted him, though. All right, all the Mr. Vincent's. Once you get past all the Mr. Vincent's, you're going to start getting closer and closer, that is, if you want to. And if you look for it and wait for it to the kind of information that will be very, very dear to your heart. Among other things, you'll find that you're not the first person who is ever confused and, and frightened, even sickened by human behavior. You're by no means alone on that score. You'll be excited and stimulated to know many, many, many men have been just as troubled morally and spiritually as you are right now. Happily, some of them kept records of their troubles. You'll learn from them if you want to. Just as someday, if you have something to offer, someone will learn something from you. It's a beautiful, reciprocal arrangement. And it isn't education. It's history. It's poetry. He stopped and took a big drink out of his highball. Then he started again. 
Boy, he was really hot. I was glad I didn't try to stop him or anything. I'm not trying to tell you, he said, that only educated and scholarly men are able to contribute something valuable to the world. It's not so. But I do say that educated and scholarly men, if they're brilliant and creative to begin with, which unfortunately is rarely the case, tend to leave infinitely more valuable records behind than them the men than that the men then do who are merely brilliant and creative they tend to express themselves more clearly and they usually have a passion for following their thoughts through to the end and most important nine times out of ten they have more humility than the unscholarly thinker. Do you follow me at all? Yes, sir. He didn't say anything again for quite a while. I don't know if you've ever done it, but it's sort of hard to sit around waiting for people to say something when they're thinking and all. It really is. I kept trying not to yawn. It wasn't that I was bored or anything. I wasn't, but I was so damn sleepy all of a sudden. Something else an academic education will do for you. If you go along with it any considerable distance, it'll begin to give you an idea of what size mind you have, what it'll fit, and maybe what it won't. After a while, you'll have an idea of what kind of thoughts your particular size mind should be wearing. For one thing, it may save you an extraordinary amount of time trying on ideas that don't suit you, aren't becoming to you. You'll begin to know your true measurements and dress your mind accordingly. Then, all of a sudden, I yawned. What a rude bastard. But I couldn't help it. <laughs> Mr. Antolini just laughed, though. Come on, he said, and got up. We'll fix up the couch for you. I followed him, and he went over to this closet and tried to take down some sheets and blankets and stuff. It was on the top shelf, but he couldn't do it with his highball glass in his hand. So he drank it, and then put the glass down on the floor. And then he took the stuff down. I helped him bring it over to the couch. We both made the bed together. He wasn't too hot at it. He didn't tuck anything in very tight. I didn't care though. I could have slept standing up. I was so tired. How are all your women? They're okay. I was being a lousy conversationalist, but I didn't feel like it. How Sally... He knew old Sally Hayes. I introduced him once. She's all right. I had a date with her this afternoon. Boy, it seemed like 20 years ago. We don't have too much in common anymore. Hell of a pretty girl. What about that other girl, the one you told me about in Maine? Oh, Jane Gallagher? She's all right. I'm probably going to give her a buzz tomorrow. We were all done making up the couch then. It's all yours, Mr. Antolini said. I don't know what the hell you're going to do with those legs of yours. That's all right. I'm used to short beds, I said. Thanks a lot, sir. You and Mrs. Antolini really saved my life tonight. You know where the bathroom is. If there's anything you want, just holler. I'll be in the kitchen for a while. Will the light bother you? No, heck no. Thanks a lot. All right. Good night, handsome. Good night. Thanks a lot. He went out into the kitchen and I went into the bathroom and got undressed and all. I couldn't brush my teeth because I didn't have any toothbrush with me. I didn't have any pajamas either and Mr. Antolini forgot to lend me some. So I just went back in the living room and turned off this little lamp next to the couch. And then I got in bed with just my shorts on. It was way too short for me, the couch, but I could have slept standing up without batting an eyelash. I laid awake for just a couple of seconds thinking about all that stuff Mr. Antolini told me about finding the size of your mind and all. He was a pretty smart guy, but I just couldn't keep my goddamn eyes open and I fell asleep. 
Then something happened. I don't even like to talk about it. I woke up all of a sudden. I don't know what time it was or anything, but I woke up. I felt something on my head, some guy's hand. Boy, it really scared the hell out of me. What it was, it was Mr. Antolini's hand. What he was doing, he was sitting on the floor right next to the couch, in the dark and all, and he was sort of petting me or patting me on the goddamn head. Boy, I'll bet I jumped about a thousand feet. What the hell are you doing? I said. Nothing. I'm simply sitting here admiring. What the hell? What are you doing anyway? I said over again. I didn't know what the hell to say. I mean, I was embarrassed as hell. How about keep your voice down? I'm I'm simply sitting here. I have to go. Anyway, I said. Boy, was I nervous. I started putting on my damn pants on the uh, they on my damn pants on in the dark. I, I could hardly get them on. I was just so damn nervous. I know more damn perverts at schools and all than anybody you ever met. And they're always being perverty when I'm around. You have to go where, Mr. Antolini said. He was trying to act very goddamn casual and cool and all, but he wasn't any too goddamn cool, take my word. I left my bags and all at the station. I think maybe I'd better go down and get them. I have all my stuff in them. They'll be there in the morning. Now, just go back to bed. I'm going to go to bed myself. What's the matter with you? Nothing's the matter. It's just that all my money and stuff's in one of those, in one of my bags. I'll be right back. I'll get a cab and I'll be right back, I said. Boy, I was falling all over myself in the dark. The thing is, it isn't mine, the money. It's my mother's and I, don't be ridiculous, Holden. Get back in that bed. I'm going to bed myself. The money will be safe there and sound in the morning. No, no kidding. I got to get going. I really do. I was damn near all dressed already, except that I couldn't find my tie. I couldn't remember where I'd put my tie. I put on my jacket and all without it. Old Mr. Antolini was sitting now in the big chair a little ways away from me, watching me. It was dark and all, and I couldn't see him so hot, but I knew he was watching me all right. He was still boozing, too. I could see his trusty highball glass in his hand. You're a very, very strange boy. I know it, I said. I didn't even look around much for my tie, so I went without it. Goodbye, sir, I said. Thanks a lot. No kidding. He kept walking right behind me when I went to the front door, and when I rang the elevator bell, he stayed in the damn doorway. All he said was that business about my being a very, very strange boy again. Strange my ass. And then he waited in the doorway and all until the goddamn elevator came. I never waited so long for an elevator in my whole goddamn life. I swear. I didn't know what the hell to talk about while I was waiting for the elevator and he kept standing there. So I said, I'm going to start reading some good books. I really am. I mean, you had to say something. It was very embarrassing. You grab your bags and scoot right on back here again. I'll leave the door unlatched. Thanks a lot, I said. Goodbye. The elevator was finally there. I got in and went down. Oh, boy. Was I shaking like a madman? I was sweating too. When something perverty like that happens, I start sweating like a bastard. That kind of stuff's happened to me about 20 times since I was a kid. I can't stand it.